welcome to the Irish Tech News Podcast. I'm your guest host, Ian McRae. I'm a psychologist and author of six work psychology books, including Dark Social, Understanding the Darker Side of Work, Personality, and Social Media. I've put together a five-part mini-series on brains, communication, and digital behavior. I'm going to talk with five really interesting guests about mindset, brain health, psychological education on social media, algorithms and dating apps, and how Web3 and cryptocurrency communities form. My first guest is David Robson, who's a science writer that specializes in the extremes of the human brain, body, and behavior. He's written two books, and his latest is The Expectation Effect. The Expectation Effect is a journey through the cutting-edge science of how our mindset shapes every facet of our lives, revealing how our brains hold the keys to unlocking a better you. It's a really interesting book with great scientific grounding and has really interesting and practical advice for our daily lives. So hi, David. Thanks for joining me on the Irish Tech News podcast. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you today about your book. Um, I really enjoy all of your writing. I've enjoyed your last book, and this one was great, too. I really like your approach to kind of the practical nature of psychology and science and research. And I think um, your current book, The Expectation Effect, is going to have some really, really interesting and useful advice for people. So I'm just wondering why you chose this particular topic and um, what is The Expectation Effect and how is it kind of going to be useful for people to understand? Yeah, sure. So The Expectation Effect is this phenomenon where our beliefs create self-fulfilling prophecies um, through three separate mechanisms, basically changes to our perception, changes to our behaviour, and changes to our physiology. Um, so the most famous example of that is the placebo effect, and that's actually how I kind of got into this subject, because, you know, as a science writer, I'd written about the placebo effect a lot. Um, but then, actually... I discovered this phenomenon called the nocebo effect. So that's mm. the opposite of the placebo effect. It's where your expectations of illness can actually cause you to become sick. And this is a really common cause of lots of the side effects that we have from um, kind of drugs that we take. And I actually experienced that for myself when I was um, prescribed some pills, you know, very common pills. Um, and my doctor just told me one of the side effects you might experience from this would be severe headaches. And I did then get these really bad headaches. And it was just like pure coincidence. But I started um, at the same time I was writing this piece about the nocebo effect. And I kind of realised that those headaches could actually just be caused purely by my expectations. And that realisation actually helped to relieve the pain. So by the end of the day, um, you know, the headaches had vanished. And that just showed to me how powerful our expectations could be. And then I started like digging around and I found that actually you know, this isn't just like a kind of um, an issue for kind of clinical medicine, but actually it can affect all kinds of things like how we respond to workouts, to our diet. It can even change how long we age, um, how well we age and how long we live. So really profound for our lives. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I was looking in the book, it was really interesting to see the list of symptoms you had, you talked about and related to certain drugs and um, kind of all of the symptoms that are actually surprisingly easy to create with a nocebo effect or that expectation effect. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you about, because I think this will be really useful for a lot of people who are Googling exercise mm -hmm. techniques or diet tips or how to manage your health. How do you go about putting together the research for this book and kind of digging through all of the kind of pseudoscience and junk science related to mm -hmm. exercise and health versus the really good science that we know has a proven effect and that's going to actually... Um, be it useful for people to know. Yeah, I mean, there's so much pseudoscience, it's quite challenging to actually kind of cut through that. Um, all of the research that I use in my book is, you know, peer reviewed in good journals. Um, most mm. of the time, it's been replicated multiple times. So we know that these are kind of trustworthy results. And importantly, we also know the kind of specific mechanisms behind these expectation effects. Mm. I think that makes it really different from you know, stuff like um, the idea of manifesting, um, yeah. where it's much more about just having these kinds of um, uh, insanely positive kind of uh, expectations, you know, like unrealistic expectations that, and you just kind of visualize it. And then there's this kind of pseudoscientific law of attraction that just brings them into your life. And that's basically mm. like relying on a paranormal explanation. Uh, well, the expectation effect isn't that at all. It's like very much looking at um, these very plausible and well-documented um, uh, kind of effects that arise from the connection between the brain and the body. You know, we know that the brain is kind of act acting as this prediction machine. Um, so it's mm -hmm. constantly kind of simulating what's going to happen in our environment. And then it's kind of adjusting like the body's responses accordingly. So it's changing things like the balance of hormones, you know, blood pressure, all of these things that are important for our survival. And um, the expectation effect is really just 
one element of that system. Um, but once we know about it, we can use it to our advantage. Yeah. And how do you distinguish between kind of realistic expectations that are possible to achieve versus unrealistic expectations that are kind of high levels of fantasy or not really realistic for people to accomplish? Like, how should people distinguish between what's kind of rational and appropriate and what's more kind of magical thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of have a good intuitive sense of that, actually. And that it's like... Um, Most people do, yeah. You know, yeah, you would hope. Like, I mean, you know, I could, like, try to visualise that I'm this kind of Olympic athlete. Um, but there's a part of me that knows that's not going to happen, and it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but mm. what I can kind of set these expectations up... Um, to kind of just see a kind of modest improvement in my performance. And I can try to question the overly negative assumptions that I might have had about my fitness before. So, you know, it's very easy for you to just assume you don't have the genes to do exercise. Um, but actually, often we form those assumptions without any good basis for that. It's, you know, uh, just maybe from bad experiences at school. So you can just kind of try to think a bit more objectively about that. And that's really what the whole of the expectation effect is doing. It's, it's more trying to combat the overly negative expectations we might have and just bring them up to this kind of sweet spot where you open your mind to the possibility that actually things could be better than they really are. Yeah, and then it's being aware of that kind of evidence in your own life from your own goals, your own practice, your own achievements, right? And saying, okay, well, mm. I've only been at the gym for two weeks since, you know, New Year started. So here's the realistic improvements I've made in energy levels or um, in general fitness in two weeks or two months. But setting those goals too, right? So it makes sure you have that kind of measurable achievement of progress that is challenging those negative assumptions or reinforcing the positive ones. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So it's kind of opening your mind to the possibility that, you know, maybe you're kind of holding yourself back with your negative expectations. And then, mm -hmm. so with fitness, it's about reframing some of the things that might have triggered those negative expectations. So, you know, like lots of people, if they're not used to going to the gym and then they start to do exercise and they immediately feel like really out of breath and like really, you know, the muscles are aching, they take that to be a sign that they're just not cut out for exercise at all. But actually, you can reinterpret those feelings as actually just a sign that you're doing what you intended to do, which is to work your body kind of just past its comfort zone so that it can actually um, build muscles, increase the capacity of your lungs, you know, all of these things. Like the uncomfortable feelings that you're experiencing are actually a good sign that you're doing the work you want to achieve. Um, so like reinterpreting your the sensations like that in a very honest scientific way can actually be really helpful. And then like you said, it's kind of looking for those incremental improvements and just recognizing that what you should focus on is the trajectory so kind of trying to get a bit better each time um, rather than say comparing yourself to like the person next to you at the gym who maybe is yeah. like super fit and has been working out for like 10 years and used to be a professional athlete you know you want to focus on your own progress and your own improvements and celebrate each gain that you make yeah, absolutely. The other thing, the point that you've made that I think is really interesting and really important is about reframing those symptoms or reframe, reframing the kind of signs of stress. You know, if you've got like a bit of a racing heart or sweaty palms, I mean, in exercise, that might be a good thing. Um, but in, in the expectation effect, you talk about is that kind of excitement? Is it nervousness? Like, what is that emotion? And there's a lot of um, kind of interpretation that our brains and minds do in understanding those kind of signs or symptoms, right? Are they good? Are they positive? Are they negative? Um, should we be chasing after those? Or how should we be understanding those? And I think, um, how do you think we can kind of reframe that or understand those kind of physical symptoms of stress in our um, lives and motivation? Yeah, I mean, that's all that you said is totally true. And I think like, so we've been speaking about kind of exercise and reinterpreting that kind of physical stress as you're um, working out. But actually, you know, the anxieties that we feel when we're facing a big challenge, you know, taking an important exam, going for an interview, doing public speaking, you know, we actually, we experience a lot of the similar kind of feelings like um, the racing heart, sweaty palms, um, shortness of breath, um, you know, just that feeling of being kind of wired. Um, and like, you know, I think our culture kind of encourages us to think that that anxiety is like debilitating, that actually, mm -hmm. like, if you're going to perform well, you have to be super calm, super laid back to not feel that stress. Um, what the research has shown is that actually, when you just assume that stress or anxiety is debilitating, that's actually when it um, harms your performance. But there can be another self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's that you can actually see the anxiety as a kind of source of energy and motivation um 
and the, you know that actually a lot of the symptoms you're feeling are really beneficial and that we evolved these uh, responses because they're adaptive so you know yeah. when you're in front of a huge crowd and you're feeling kind of pumped up with your heart like racing that's actually pumping a lot of oxygenated blood around your body um, especially to your brain so it can kind of use that fuel to kind of uh, think on its feet um, similarly you know we know that the levels of cortisol the stress hormone um, actually at moderate levels that's just really useful for helping you to kind of be on the ball and to, to make sure that you're really focused um, and the research has found that actually just teaching people to reinterpret their anxiety in this more positive way so not suppressing the feeling and not denying that it's uncomfortable mm. but just recognizing that it serves a purpose that that actually then helps these people to perform better and it also changes how they recover from the stress afterwards so you know they can the body can go back to the other jobs that it's meant to be doing like digestion you know um kind of healing your tissues um more quickly after this stressful event whereas if you see stress as being debilitating you have like higher levels of cortisol you know for the whole day basically and then that stops the body from recovering um so that can also then maybe have an effect on the long-term effects of stress if you're doing presentations like every day and you're having this view that actually that anxiety is debilitating well then that's when you're going to be more likely to get you know have cardiovascular disease whereas if you see it as being potentially enhancing you're less likely to suffer those long-term effects yeah and then understanding some of the mechanisms and strategies to manage that stress too right because i find personally sometimes stress is a very good way of focusing my attention on something that i should right. be worrying about um, and sometimes yeah. if i'm not worried about a deadline or i'm not stressed about something it's I'm, it actually results in me not preparing quite as much or me mm. not you know worrying about something that i should be worrying about or concerned about or thinking about but then it's distinguishing that kind of adaptive useful focusing stress versus stressing about stuff that you know you can't control you can't manage you can't change you can't really have an impact on so understanding what's the useful kind of stress to address focus on and look at your expectations towards versus some of the stuff that you might look at other ways of adapting to the stress if you can't control it yeah totally that's exactly what how i see this as like it's very, really useful in some of these um situations that are kind of stressful but also kind of positive and actually you know often we're choosing to put ourselves in these kind of challenging situations you know yeah. like when i'm given the opportunity to do a talk i can always say no but I say yes, because I actually want to do it, because I want to engage with the audience. But then when I'm, you know, standing on the stage, it can be easy to forget that. So I think reframing stress in those situations is really helpful. Um, I think it's maybe less helpful, like you said, if it's these kind of uh, chronic stresses that you have no control over. And then it's much mm -hmm. better to look for kind of proactive ways to kind of reduce that stress or to find other coping mechanisms. Yeah, because there's all sorts of types of stress that are really severe, you know, if you're looking at people having illness in the family or personal mm, illness yeah. or all sorts of stuff like that, that reframing is might be helpful in some sense. But then there's also all sorts of other kind of stress management techniques and stuff that you need to to manage yeah. the stress, because if you can't control the source of it, then there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly how I see it. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to ask you about is social anxiety, because I think right now there's a lot of people who have social anxiety who may not be used to it just because in the last couple of years with restrictions on social contact and visiting people and how we're what we're supposed to do at work and our social life and seeing other people there's been so many rules and changes and i think there's a lot of uncertainty about social situations that people are struggling with for all sorts of different reasons and i think that uncertainty is sometimes masking stress or confusion about what the rules are sometimes um, belying people's kind of understanding or misunderstanding about what we're supposed to be doing. So how do we manage our expectations about social situations? Is there stuff we can talk to other people about it, managing the situation, managing external influences? What kind of stuff should we be doing to manage kind of social anxiety for people who have had it either for a long period of time or for who it's fairly new to? Yeah, I mean, I'm really glad you brought that up. So I actually had quite severe social anxiety when I was a teenager. And then, you know, I kind of got over it um, by the time I went to university. Um, but then, weirdly, like, um, after the lockdowns, I felt like I was this awkward teenager again. And, yeah, you know, it's quite a, yeah, like quite a horrible shock when you just think, like, have I forgotten how to have, like, a casual conversation with someone? Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I do think it's a really common uh, phenomenon, uh, both for people who've had social anxiety in the past, but also uh, people who haven't. Um, but there is research on the expectation effect with social anxiety. Um, so one one uh, technique is what we've already spoken about, and it's actually to recognise that you know if you're feeling a bit anxious about a new interaction, that doesn't mean automatically and inevitably that you're going to kind of make a bad impression uh, on that person. Actually, there's this thing called the liking gap, which is basically this idea that when two people have had a conversation and they go away, each one thinks that the other person didn't like them as much as Mm. they really did. So we all kind of have this negative bias that thinks that um, we made a worse impression than we really did. Um, So actually just, uh, you know, reframing the anxiety you're feeling and to recognise that actually you know, it's just helping you maybe to pay more attention to the person you're speaking to and that you don't have to kind of feel shame at being a bit nervous, like, you know, everyone's feeling the same way. That can be really useful. Um, There's also research on the growth mindset. So this is this idea that you, um, rather than seeing like a kind of your qualities and talents as being kind of purely innate and inherent and unchangeable you just recognize that actually you can get better over time you know through that Mm -hmm. kind of incremental trajectory that I mentioned Um, and there's research showing that you know even for people who've had like uh, social anxiety for very long periods kind of teaching them about the growth mindset and just recognizing that actually like if you make some kind of social faux pas that doesn't mean that you're like just permanently and always going to be like awkward in conversation but actually it's just like one small kind of um mishap that doesn't reflect anything innate within you um actually that can be really helpful too it just makes you feel more relaxed uh, in the conversation and helps you to get over those slight awkward awkward moments a bit more quickly which just means that um overall you're going to feel better and you'll get over your social anxiety more quickly Um, so that's it really and I just think it is a case Mm -hmm. of just like practice essentially like just kind of putting yourself in these situations again yeah and I think too people shouldn't be too worried about talking about those anxieties if they have them if it's with friends or people they trust or family you can just say oh I'm a bit nervous about this situation Um, and I've done a lot of research into kind of stress and anxiety and the kind of personality traits that underlie it and I find a lot of people who are a bit more stressed about social situations underestimate how stressed other people are so they think they're a lot more anxious than other people when often they're just kind of average, they're experiencing the same levels of stress, the same anxieties about similar things, but they don't necessarily realize it until they have a conversation about it. So do you think people should do that kind of in introductions or when you're planning stuff out to say, I'm a bit nervous about that, kind of a bit of self-disclosure sometimes helps to connect over that and then get past it quicker? Yeah, I totally think that's true. That actually, and it's almost like once you've admitted it, that in itself is a bit of an icebreaker, uh, yeah. to be honest. But um, and that does remind me actually of a story of one of my friends went to this party with um, Kira, where Kira Knightley was at the party, and um, okay. my friend was like, "Oh, I felt so awkward," and you know, she was very aloof. She just didn't speak to anyone. And then I read an interview with Kira Knightley like a few days later, saying like. It was just awful. I was at this party the other day and I was so shy I didn't speak to anyone. Um, (laughs) It made me realise that actually, you know, we can have these assumptions about other people who might seem outwardly confident, but actually they're probably feeling very similar things to us. Well, that's a really interesting point, too, about expectations related to social status, right? So if Mm -hmm. you have these expectations about yourself, but also about where you are in relation to other people kind of socially, cognitively or emotionally, when it's not necessarily true and you don't know unless you have a conversation about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, the kind of public persona that they're presenting is very different from how they feel inside. And often like what we see as someone being like very confident, that's just almost like this act that they're performing. Yeah, and sometimes it's kind of our perceptions of them instead of how they're trying to actually present themselves, which is... Oh yeah, absolutely. ...would explain that. Um, Yeah, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, I wanted to go back to diet a bit, because I think this is really interesting about our perceptions and relationships to food, about what's indulgent or what we see as indulgent versus what kind of is and how things are marketed. How do you think that has an impact and how can we change our relation or or kind of shape our relationship to what we want to be eating versus what we feel we should be eating versus what's actually good for us? Yeah, I mean, I think like uh, we have a lot of like intuitions, especially in like um, the UK and uh, Ireland and North America, that um, if something is healthy, it's not satisfying and it's not tasty. Mm. Like there's actually a lot of research showing that we just have these kinds of um, 
beliefs about food. So it's like if you're treating yourself, it has to be something that's kind of junk food, not something that's actually super nutritious. Um, but then this can have like a really big impact on the way like our brain and then our body actually responds to the food that we're eating. Um, so there was this great study uh, from uh, researchers at Stanford University that looked at um, the hormone, hunger hormone ghrelin. So essentially, if you eat a big, satisfying meal, um, levels of ghrelin drop. So ghrelin um, stimulates appetite and you'd expect, you know, after you've had something really satisfying that it's um, it drops because you don't need to be eating for a few hours. Um, so what these researchers did was they wondered whether actually that could be a product of our expectations rather than the food we've actually consumed. So they got these mm. participants into the lab on two separate occasions um, and they gave them identical milkshakes each time. But the labelling was totally different. So the first time the label kind of showed this, uh, it, it presented it as this kind of sensible health shake that seemed just really insipid. And they were told it only had <laughs> 200 calories that, you know, nothing about the marketing made it seem attractive. Um, the other time they kind of had the same milkshake, but it was presented as this kind of indulgent, delicious shake, um, you know, luxurious. It was filled with like ice cream. You know, they it, the label emphasised the delicious flavour. They were told it had about 600 calories. So, you know, really substantial kind of replacement for a meal, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. What the researchers found was that when they had the luxurious shake, the levels of ghrelin, the hunger hormone, dropped exactly as it would do if you'd had a satisfying meal. Um, mm -hmm. But for the people having the sensible shake with only 200 calories, the ghrelin barely changed at all. Um, it was just as high as it had been before they'd had the snack. Um, and that's like super counterproductive if you're on a diet and you're kind of punishing yourself by having insipid foods just because yeah. they're low calories, you're still going to have like high levels of ghrelin after you've eaten. So then you're going to have worse hunger pangs later on and you're going to be more likely to snack because your brain has told your body that it hasn't received enough nutrition. Um, so really, like, we have to change that mindset if we're dieting. And rather than just choosing insipid foods purely for the low calorie content, we should really be choosing stuff that excites us. You know, things with interesting flavours and textures and, you know, something that feels like a celebration. Yeah, and I think there's all sorts of ways to make stuff more indulgent, right? Because I quite like cooking and I think for me, an indulgent meal, part of the process is choosing the ingredients and exactly what I want and combining it in what, the right way and taking a little extra time to make food. So in a way, I'm thinking more about food for a longer period of time, but just enjoying the experience in a different way kind of makes it more satisfying instead of just about specifically the calories and the nutritional um, kind of criteria and stuff that can help too, I think. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, you know, anticipating what you're eating and planning it really carefully, like you said, that can be really helpful. And there are studies showing that actually, and even like visualising yourself eating the food, um, mm. it can actually mean that you get more enjoyment per bite. So you feel satisfied with fewer bites, basically. Um, and, you know, yeah. this is great, even with something like chocolate cake, when people visualise eating the chocolate cake beforehand, they will happily choose a smaller portion. And then they feel more satisfied after that smaller portion. So yeah, it's really useful to, to just be thinking about food and the pleasure you're getting from food rather than just focusing on the low calorie content. Yeah, and actually focusing on the pleasure of it, right? Because you say in the book too, mm. don't watch TV or don't have other distractions while you're eating. So yeah. do more to actually enjoy the food, whatever it is, instead of just trying to get more of it and while you're not thinking of it or just kind of while you're distracted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the worst thing really is to be kind of working while you're eating because, you know, your mind is so fully occupied that it's not it's not actually registering like what you've consumed. And then the predictor machine is kind of panicking because it thinks it hasn't had enough fuel. And then it's triggering that kind of response to generate bigger appetite because it feels like it needs like more energy, essentially. Yeah, it's amazing how many of these biological responses are really, really shaped by our mind as much as kind of all of the mm. physical elements. So the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is how kind of digital communication, online behavior, how all of that shapes our expectations. Because I think, I mean, especially over the last two years, but for a lot of people, a lot of our kind of social contact, the social information we're getting, the feedback we're getting, their kind of cultural expectations are coming online, right? Instead of necessarily from our in-person friend groups. So how much do you think that is shaping people's expectations for things like fitness, dieting, um, for work, for expectations about all of that different stuff? 
Yeah, I think it's like really important because essentially like it encourages social comparison and often these are negative social comparisons. So, you know, we all try to present the best side of ourselves on social media. Mm. And, you know, there's lots of tools we can use to, you know, airbrush pictures to make us look healthier and fitter than we really are. Um, And then like you're looking at these pictures and you're forgetting that maybe you're doing the same thing yourself. Um, Mm -hmm. But you're you're kind of assuming that other people are happier and healthier. And that makes you feel a lot worse about yourself. Um, So that's just really important fundamentally for our well-being. Like there's loads of research showing that that kind of social comparison can actually be really bad for our life satisfaction. So we should stop it for that reason. But then actually, I think when we look specifically at things like fitness, it can also have additional effects. So there was a study looking at um, kind of fitspiration posts on Instagram. So you know, where you see like incredibly toned kind of people like kind of showing off about their workouts. Um, And basically, these researchers just got their participants to either look at those pictures or kind of travel pictures before they did a workout themselves. Um, And it seems that the negative social comparison, so feeling like inadequate compared to other people, that had set up this assumption that these people were less, you know, just less physically fit. Um, So that Mm -hmm. meant that actually while they were working out, um, they found the workout a lot harder. And then after the workout, they didn't really experience the runner's high that you might get after kind of pounding on the treadmill for half an hour. Um, They just weren't so happy. It was, you know, it made the whole experience less pleasant. And, you know, they're called Fitspiration posts because they're meant to be motivating. But from this study, it seems like they're doing exactly the opposite. They're actually making it much harder for you to achieve your goals. Yeah, that's interesting, too, because I think just like we'd want to reflect on our kind of cognition and how we're um, on our expectations for stuff in the physical world, I think it's important to reflect on that, to be conscious of how it's um, affecting us online, too, because I'm sure there are posts that do actually motivate people for, you know, fitness or health or think, OK, here's a specific strategy or here's a technique I can use at the gym that I want to do now because I've just learned about it versus stuff that is kind of seems off limits or demotivating because it's not really necessarily within what we expect to be possible. So I think there's a lot that people can do to reflect on what expectations are being created for them online when you're scrolling through stuff to see, OK, this this section of stuff is really demotivating for me or this is creating positive expectations. Expectations, so maybe I want to follow and click and kind of have more of this positive stuff as part of my kind of social group or following group than some of the negative stuff. So um, how much do you think people should be kind of conscious of that? Is it too much work to be thinking about that all the time? Or should you set aside some time to think about your, those kind of social expectations? No, yeah, I totally think that we should be conscious of the ways our expectations are being shaped by other people. And, you know, in this particular kind of situation, you know, when we're talking about fitness, but also I think any other area, say, you know, uh, you know, performance at work or education or whatever, actually, what's most useful for us and what's most motivating and is going to kind of help us to succeed is actually when people are talking about the challenges they faced and how they overcame them them Mm -hmm. and I think because you're like you're kind of learning something practical from that advice and what that isn't doing is setting up this idea that you know it's not like that person is here and you're here and there's no kind of um and there's no way for you to get to that level which is demotivating I think actually it's helping you to recognize how you could also follow the same positive trajectory and you know just recognizing that actually there are like real practical concrete steps that you can take to achieve your goal whereas I think if people are just posting kind of the photos of the the effects of their workouts without actually telling you like how they got there that's when you have the negative social comparison that's just um, really unhealthy. Yeah and would you have any recommendations for whether or not people should be posting kind of their own progress on whatever their goals or motivations are is that helpful to be kind of publicly accountable for it in a way does it depend on who you're accountable to like where you're posting it should people be doing that privately or more publicly do you think or does it depend i reckon like in a way like i mean you know more about this than i do (laughs) Um, and maybe my views were actually have been informed by your book uh, so uh, like uh, tell me if i'm just (laughs) repeating stuff you've already said but um but yeah, I feel like actually maybe if we, when we post on social media, if we were almost mindful of like, how would this sound if I was actually with my group of friends and mm-hmm. I told them, like, you know, if if you feel that you wouldn't say something to like someone face to face, maybe you shouldn't say it on social media um, as a kind of general rule of thumb. Um, yeah, I think that would stop you from being maybe 
too kind of varnished in the uh, kind of presentation of yourself on social media. Um, but just in general, I think, yeah, it's fine to celebrate our successes. And actually, there is good research on confelicity, this idea that people can, you know, rejoice in the success of others. Um, I just think you have to be careful in the way that you're presenting it. And definitely, like, like acknowledging the challenges that you had to face to get to that point, and just being mm -hmm. kind of humble in the way you present your successes. I think that's really important. Yeah, and I'd say probably know your audience too, or figure make sure you're in the right group. So don't post kind of gym photos on LinkedIn, but maybe there's oh, yeah. positive, constructive communities on you know on certain social media channels or groups that are all doing the same thing, kind of trying to reach the same objective, have realistic goals, are supportive and helpful instead of just kind of generically mm. self-promoting. But really making sure you're doing the right thing in the right situation in a way that's going to help you and be more productive. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, I feel like maybe on a platform like Facebook, where you might have people from like all different kind of walks of life and stages of, of their life, then mm -hmm. that's when the self-promotion might become more problematic. Because it's like what might seem like totally achievable and, you know, um, kind of like a... Uh, like laudable for one person might just look like bragging to another person um, in that social yeah. network. So just being conscious of that is really important. Yeah, and that's a good place where it would be really useful to be aware of your own expectations and kind of what your own goals are in there to think, okay, why yeah. am I posting this to this group? Is this constructive for the group or am I doing it for another reason to impress someone or to impress a group of people? Or is it, you know, for what reason? Because sometimes that kind of reflection is not always easy, but it can be useful once you notice what the motives are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the other thing I want to ask is if there's anything recently since you published the book, is there anything you've noticed about expectations in your own life or in people around you that you didn't think of before the book, but now that you're kind of mentally in that frame of mind, you're seeing it everywhere, seeing it in certain um, locations that are interesting? Mm, I'm still like super interested. So I've just had COVID like a, about a month ago now, and okay. I'm finding it super difficult to get back to doing like my regular kind of exercise and I think like what and I've noticed this on social media like in conversations with friends as well that like all of us seem to be struggling to work out like what you know how much is that just because of my expectation it's like I feel like I've been sick and then it's like I feel I assume I'm not as capable um to do the exercises I was before so I'm kind of taking it easy you know should I be pushing myself a little bit harder than I had been you know mm. should I be applying that kind of um, research that I've been talking about, you know, reframing the feelings of fatigue. Or, you know, uh, we're also really worried that, like, maybe the virus has kind of damaged our lungs a bit and, you know, we need longer to recover and we don't want to kind of have a relapse or get kind of long COVID because mm. we're kind of um, pushing ourselves too hard too quickly. And that's super difficult to navigate. But I am really happy that having written my book that at least I'm aware I'm aware of the question and because yeah. I think it is important for me to kind of question like am I you know maybe overreacting to this a bit and maybe holding myself back when I don't need to you know because mm. I think that's where like problems could also arise is if if like um I just stopped exercising because I'd had COVID and because I'm like trying to recover and then like got like super out of shape because of that and then I'd find it you know, six months time, I'll still be struggling to kind of uh, get my fitness back. So I think actually, like just being aware that my expectations might be shaping how I'm feeling, and then just trying to kind of push myself out of the comfort zone, kind of a uh, little by little to kind of test like what the truth really is. That's, that's been really helpful for me. And I think, you know, on social media, I just see loads of people discussing the same kind of questions. So. Yeah, that's an interesting one, especially because fatigue has been so talked about so much as one of the key symptoms and it obviously is fatigue can be a very real symptom related to you know amount of oxygen you're getting to the in the blood and in the brain and it can be but it can also be psychological it's really easy to be fatigued kind of psychologically versus physically mm. right so it's tough to navigate that distinction and I think but that really highlights how there's not kind of one answer it's not always the mind or always the body one or the other right. it's kind of a constant dynamic feedback process which I think you've explained really yeah. well in the book um, how there's not kind of this one strategy you can use but it's kind of a dynamic thing you always have to be aware of and practicing pretty much consistently yeah. throughout your life if you want to keep understanding your own expectations your own reactions to them and how you want to fit that into your kind of goals in life yeah exactly um you know in a way like now I just don't think it makes sense to kind of separate kind of 
mental health and physical health because yeah. actually the lines are blurred um so much and you know like in this case like you said like fatigue has like physical components and mental components and they're both going to interact and, and you need to kind of constantly be aware of that and you know i think you know going back to what i said at the start you know there are these three components or kind of mechanisms of the expectation effect is like perception behavior and physiology and they're all kind of so interlinked you can't really separate them but in a case like this actually you know what i'm trying to do is question the percep perceptions i'm having while also acknowledging that there could be a real physiological origin and then just kind of trying to adjust my behavior according to kind of the way i'm reframing what i'm feeling um so yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's a tricky kind of thing to navigate but i think it's just useful to be conscious and aware that yeah you're of the mental components as well as the physical components yeah and you've done the final thing i want to say is you've done a really nice job i really like the summaries at the end of chapters where you've given kind of notes about what to do strategies for things to think about things to do things to practice in your own life about food exercise about work about all of these different things that i think people will find really really practical so i really want to encourage people to read the book because it's great i loved it i agreed with everything in it um and do you have any plans for another book anything else you're working on soon uh, yeah, I have vague plans, but I haven't really put together a proposal yet. So it's actually okay. it's just finding the time to kind of write about that. So yeah, I can't say what the subject uh, will be about. But actually, um, it could be helpful for people who have social anxiety. So yeah, I'll save that much. Okay, interesting. I will look forward to talking to you about that another time. But thanks cool. really. Thanks so much for talking to me today. It was really interesting, really enjoyable. Thank you. Oh yeah, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for the conversation. Mm -hmm.